even without the iconic prologue crawl or that classic a long time ago text that precedes most entries in the saga, most people could be dragged into a theater showing a Star Wars film they've never seen and still know exactly what they were watching within moments. Here's why. Something really, really bad always happens pretty much every time a bottomless shaft appears in a Star Wars movie. If the saga's heroes had any sense at all, they would have learned by now that whenever they walk into a room with a bottomless shaft, they need to turn around and run the hell away. Qui-Gon meets his violent end at the foot of one of these impossibly long tunnels in Phantom Menace. Both halves of Darth Maul plummet down one of those shafts, just like Darth Vader hurls the Emperor down one in Return of the Jedi. Luke miraculously survives a drop down Cloud City's bottomless shaft in The Empire Strikes Back, and Obi Obi-Wan hops over one to turn off the Death Star's tractor beam in A New Hope. The heroes of Rogue One also climb up one to get hold of the Death Star plans. And then there's The Force Awakens. Frankly, Han should have known better than to walk out over one. The shafts of Star Wars are legion, and if you see one, you're probably in big trouble. Star Wars movies tend to be bad for limbs, and probably very kind to black market prosthetics dealers. Someone loses a limb in most entries, and whether you're watching the movies based on theatrical release or in chronological order, it's not going to take long before someone loses something very important to them. Darth Maul loses everything below his waist in Phantom Menace and is revealed to have survived the ordeal in the Star Wars The Clone Wars animated series, even making a cameo in Solo A Star Wars Story. Anakin Skywalker says goodbye to the first of many soon-to-be-lost limbs when Count Dooku relieves him of an arm in Attack of the Clones, and he loses the remaining arm and both legs in Revenge of the Sith. No major characters lose limbs in A New Hope, though Obi-Wan does leave a cantina bully's bloody arm on the bar, and later later loses his entire body, if you want to count that. Luke takes off a Wampa's hairy arm in Empire Strikes Back, his father sends Luke's hand spinning down a shaft later in the film, and Luke pays him back by taking off one of Vader's already replaced hands in Return of the Jedi. Neither of the newest trilogy's released entries feature limb loss, but both had deleted scenes with amputations. Chewbacca tears off Unkar Plutt's arm in a snipped Force Awakens scene, and The Last Jedi originally had Captain Phasma's hand sliced off by Finn just before her death. First introduced in Empire Strikes Back, Yoda has proven to be one of the most popular and oft-quoted characters in the Star Wars mythos. From his first scenes in Empire, the Jedi Master earned a reputation as a near-bottomless font of wisdom. Great warrior! <laughs> Wars not make one great! <laughs> Although with the advent of CGI and the release of Attack of the Clones, the Syntax Challenge Jedi was able to prove himself a badass warrior as well. But Yoda's also part of a Star Wars tradition that doesn't begin or end on Dagobah. Almost every entry in the franchise includes at least one character like Yoda. Someone who initially seems physically unimpressive, but ultimately proves to not only be an expert warrior, but a source of great wisdom, and usually information about the mysterious Force, even if the character isn't a Jedi. A New Hope gave us Obi-Wan, the oldest hero in the film's ragtag group, who nevertheless easily saves Luke from Ponda Baba and later fights Darth Vader in a lightsaber duel. Yoda fills the role in both Empire and Return of the Jedi, as well as appearing in all of the prequel films. Chirrut Imwe is arguably the most formidable hand-to-hand -hand combatant to appear in Rogue One, as well as being the most vocal supporter of the Force in the film. The enigmatic Maz Kanata plays the part in the newest trilogy, even though her connection to the Jedi, if there is any, hasn't yet been revealed. People have a lot of fun flying in Star Wars. That's not to say they shouldn't have fun, especially since they're usually just a few minutes away from having their arms chopped off and thrown down a bottomless shaft. Why not make the most of it? But it's still kind of remarkable just how much fun they're having. And there's an almost endless stream of wahoos and yeehaws to be heard throughout the saga's many stories. And they usually happen in the cockpit of a spaceship. Whether it's Han celebrating finally taking out a TIE fighter, or even the young Anakin Skywalker belting out the occasional wahoo while threading through Trade Federation droid fighters, Star Wars heroes really like to yell, even when they're having a really bad day. Take Finn, who when he first escapes the clutches of the First Order with Poe, is wahooing up and down the dark void of space as he and his new buddy both narrowly escape death. While the Star Wars galaxy boasts a wide variety of planets, the planets themselves don't tend to offer a wide variety of climates and terrains. In fact, the worlds of Star Wars tend to be planets of extremes. While our own Earth has a few deserts, for example, if there's a desert on a planet in a Star Wars film, then it's likely because the entire planet is a desert, like the reoccurring setting of Tatooine or Force Awakens Jakku. 
If there's ice and snow on the planet, there's ice and snow everywhere. Like the frigid planet Hoth in the beginning of Empire Strikes Back. There's the swamp planet Dagobah, the ocean planet Kamino, and the volcano planet Mustafar in Revenge of the Sith. The final location in Return of the Jedi is even referred to as the Forest Moon of Endor, in case visitors aren't quite sure of what extreme and singular environment they should expect. Speaking of extreme planets, how about this? No matter what the story is about or who the lead character is, the Star Wars saga just keeps on bringing us back to one of two desert planets. Usually it's Tatooine, though Tatooine is replaced by the equally desolate and arid Jakku in The Force Awakens. Even The Rise of Skywalker is posed to add the Star Wars roster of desert planets with the strange rocky world of Pasana. Now, it is a little surprising that Tatooine in particular features quite so much in the Star Wars mythos, if for no other reason than a series set in a galaxy chock full of planets inhabited by intelligent life keeps swinging back to the same dry ball of sand. Well, if there's a bright center to the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. While the question of Tatooine's specific connection to the Force has yet to be directly addressed in the films, it would be surprising if its reoccurring appearances had nothing to do with a strong connection to the Force. From Luke's training on Dagobah and Empire Strikes Back and Rey's time spent on Acto in The Last Jedi, we know certain places in the universe are particularly strong with the Force. Considering Tatooine is the birthplace of Anakin Skywalker, the childhood home of Luke Skywalker, and the decades-long hiding place of Obi-Wan Kenobi, it's probably fair to say that the place has at least some kind of significant connection to the Force as a whole. The universe is a big place, and the Star Wars galaxy hides many titans. Star Wars boasts enough giant monsters to fill the cast of any decent Godzilla flick. Unlike most of the monsters in Godzilla, though, Star Wars titans are weirdly good at hiding, especially considering their size. Often, these monsters even appear as naturally occurring parts of the terrain. Most famously, there's the mighty Sarlacc of Return of the Jedi who swallows Boba Fett and dozens of Jabba the Hutt's henchmen. From afar, the Sarlacc looks like nothing more than a huge hole in the ground. But once you get close enough to spot the teeth and the tendrils, you're probably already lunch. Equally sneaky is the gargantuan space slug of Empire Strikes Back, who almost makes a meal of the heroes when Han mistakes the beast's insides for a cave. Then there's the Dianoga, the beast who almost drags Luke to his death in the trash compactor scene of A New Hope, and who mostly appears off-screen. The Rancor, though not exactly as cleverly hidden as the Sarlacc or the space slug, is kept out of sight for its first few scenes in Return of the Jedi. There are also the multiple aquatic giants who threaten the heroes of Phantom Menace as they navigate Naboo's waterways. And then, of course, there's the massive, tentacled Summa Verminoth who tries to devour the Millennium Falcon in Solo. Droids don't do what droids are supposed to do. Or, more commonly, they do what they're supposed to do, but only after complaining about it for a really long time. C-3PO is constantly arguing against the hero's plans, and R2-D2 is usually preoccupied with some secret mission. In Rogue One, K-2 second-guesses all of Cassian's decisions, and sets himself up as the authority on who can and who cannot be trusted. While in Solo, L-3 is more concerned with starting a droid revolution than with being helpful. Ironically, perhaps the best evidence of this is in the rare example of a droid doing what it's supposed to do. In Phantom Menace, R2-D2 is introduced as one of a number of droids who are dispatched to repair Queen Amidala's ship while under fire. R2 is the only droid to survive and manages to fix the ship's hyperdrive. Later, Amidala thanks the droid for its service and orders it to be specially cleaned as a reward. Which means, apparently, a droid doing precisely what it was designed to do is such a rare occurrence in the Star Wars narrative that when it actually happens, any nearby humans feel the need to set up a freaking award ceremony. The Moss Eisley Cantina from A New Hope is the setting of one of the franchise's most well-remembered scenes, and also one of its most replicated. Similar hives of scum and villainy can be found in just about every Star Wars film. Jabba's Palace in Return of the Jedi is basically a larger, grander version of the Moss Eisley Cantina. In one of Attack of the Clones' few genuinely funny moments, Obi-Wan uses his Jedi mind trick to convince a drug dealer in a bar on Coruscant to rethink his path in life. Fittingly, Solo features almost nothing but these places of ill repute. Starting with the crime boss lair, Han escapes on Corellia, the casino on Vandor where Han first meets Lando, and later the bar on Numidian Prime where Han finally wins the Millennium Falcon from Lando. Shortly after Han meets Finn and Rey in The Force Awakens, he brings them to Maz Kanata's Cantina-esque castle on Takodana. 
And while its leader and soldiers were extremist rebels rather than bounty hunters and criminals, Saw Gerrera's stronghold on Jeddah felt a lot like Jabba's palace. Then there are the examples that seem more upscale but are nevertheless just as villainous, like Dryden Voss' yacht in Solo and the casino that caters to the super-rich residents of Canto Bight in The Last Jedi. They're fancy, sure, but that doesn't make them any nicer. Obviously, if you're going to have a bunch of hives of scum and villainy in your galaxy-spanning epic, you're going to need some actual scum and villains to populate them. Luckily, the Star Wars mythos has no shortage of smugglers, bounty hunters, organized crime bosses, and other assortments of crooks and criminals. Han Solo pretends to be the very picture of apathy in the face of the Empire's many crimes, but eventually, his heroism does shine through. Lando joins him in Empire Strikes Back, and Solo introduces us to even more rogues like Beckett and Val. Cassian of Rogue One is a different kind of scoundrel, though. While Solo acts as if he only cares about himself but nevertheless always winds up doing the right thing, Cassian tends to do the wrong thing for completely unselfish reasons, like when he murders another rebel operative in the beginning of Rogue One to stop him from being captured and revealing rebel secrets, or when he becomes more than willing to murder Galen Erso for the sake of the rebellion. One of the most recent additions to Star Wars' list of famous scoundrels is DJ in The Last Jedi. With DJ, the storytellers turn the usual figure of the Star Wars scoundrel on its head. The audience is led to believe that DJ is another reluctant hero simply feigning selfishness, but he turns out to be exactly exactly what he seems, betraying Finn and Rose to the mercies of the First Order. One of the funniest ironies of the Star Wars saga is just how many of its major characters have no idea who their parents are. In our comparatively technologically primitive real world, just about anyone in the United States could mail a DNA sample off and potentially find out what part of the world their ancestors hailed from. But in a galaxy far, far away, technology seems to be far superior to our own and no one seems to have heard of DNA testing. While speculation about Rey's parents is still running wild, she's hardly the first character in the saga to face a mystery surrounding her birth. Luke Skywalker learns Darth Vader is his father at the end of Empire Strikes Back, and Leia, who unlike Luke, has met who she believes to be her biological father and has less reason to believe there was anything mysterious at all about her birth, learns she's Luke's sister in Return of the Jedi. Then, of course, there's Vader himself. Himself. In Phantom Menace, Anakin's mother Shmi tells Qui-Gon her son has no biological father. One day she wasn't pregnant, and the next day she was, without any inciting events. And that's about as mysterious as it gets. A Star Wars movie with no lightsaber fighting is surely no Star Wars movie at all. An elegant weapon, but a more civilized age. In the earliest films, the duel usually takes place toward the end. Obi-Wan battles Vader in A New Hope, Luke's Empire Strikes Back fight with Vader is perhaps the most iconic of all the duels, and once he's fully trained, Luke proves his skills superior to Vader's in Return of the Jedi. The prequels brought us the manically choreographed battle between Darth Maul, Qui-Gon, and Obi-Wan in Phantom Menace. Obi-Wan and Anakin are both humbled by Count Dooku in Attack of the Clones, though they're saved when Yoda bursts out his crazy lightsaber skills for the first time on screen. Revenge of the Sith was the first film to deliver a duel right at the beginning, a rematch between Anakin and Dooku, along with the Jedi Council's doomed attempt to capture Palpatine, General Grievous' forearmed assault on Obi-Wan, Yoda's fight with Palpatine, and Kenobi's victory over Anakin on Mustafar. The Force Awakens was the first time the series portrayed a woman on either side of a lightsaber duel, as Rey takes on Kylo Ren after the latter easily defeats Finn. Weirdly, there's little saber-on-saber -saber action in The Last Jedi. Kylo and Rey fight back-to-back -back against Snoke's elite Praetorian Guard, Finn uses an energy baton rather than a lightsaber when he attacks Phasma, and the Luke who faces Kylo at the end of the film turns out to not have been there in the first place. The only instance in which one lightsaber physically clashes with another actually takes place during a flashback. Star Wars climaxes tend to follow one particular multi-layered formula in the sense that there's usually one main conflict made up of two or three smaller battles. Usually, there's at least one large-scale military clash contrasted against a much more personal one-on-one -on -one fight. Return of the Jedi establishes the formula. On Endor, the Ewoks and the Rebel ground forces fight the Imperial troops to take out the Death Star's shield generators, and in space, the Rebel fleet clashes with the Imperial TIE fighters and Star Destroyers. Meanwhile, on the Death Star, Luke and Vader cross lightsabers one last time. The formula returns in Phantom Menace. The Gungan army faces off against the droids on Naboo. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon have their fateful duel with Darth Maul in the palace, while Naboo fighters battle the Trade Federation's droid ships in space. Likewise, the end of The Force Awakens is split between the Rebel fleet's attempt to take out Starkiller Base and the lightsaber duel in the snow. Rogue One's tragic final clash depicts yet another space battle, 
a large-scale ground assault, and the efforts of Jin, Cassian, and K2SO to find and transmit the Death Star plans. Revenge of the Sith is one of the few entries to not include a huge military battle. Instead, going back and forth between the Obi-Wan and Vader duel on Mustafar and the fight between Yoda and Palpatine on Coruscant. A New Hope's all-out assault on the Death Star actually seems pretty simple in comparison. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.